Welcome back to the Smart Driving Cars podcast. Thanks for being here. This edition is sponsored by the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. For more information, head to MOTOETF.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with the Faculty Chair of Autonomous Vehicle Engineering at Princeton University, Alan Kornhauser. Hi, Alan. Hey, good morning, Fred. And we are happy to have joining us Salika Josiah Talbot, Principal at Autonomous Vehicle Consulting in Washington, Professorial Lecturer at American University, and a former Senior Advisor at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Great to see you again, Salika. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Wonderful to have you again, Salika. Well, at the start here, let's follow up on sessions earlier this month held by the Transportation Research Board. And you bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to the discussion, Salika. Let's start out with your assessment of maybe where we are today, midway through 2021, when it comes to employing autonomous vehicle technology to really accomplish something, get it off the drawing boards when it comes to improving lives. Thank you. I think that um, first I wanna preface by saying I am bullish on autonomous vehicles. I realize all the potential that it has to improve lives, but we have to be very frank about where we are today. The question that was asked last week was, will low income communities be the first to see autonomous vehicles in widespread use? And, um, and the answer hasn't changed. The answer is, is a resounding, of course not, given the current stage of our infrastructure today. Well, describe that for us more, more fully, what, what the issues are and how, how we can go about changing mindsets and infrastructure. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think this is a critical conversation because we have the opportunity now to improve our infrastructure so that we're ready when the technology is ready as well. Aside from the obvious of safety, we know that autonomous vehicles, as I said, has the opportunity or the ability to improve lives, but where are we today and how do we get there in the future? If you look at, um, at my background, you'll see a city sidewalk. Um, before we do anything, we're, we're pedestrians. We move on sidewalks. Uh, research shows that low income communities, um, their infrastructure is frankly horrible. Uh, the conditions in the communities, as you can see, are cracked sideways, uneven pavement. Sometimes we see standing water, uh, streets with potholes and, and, and bumps that aren't part of the infrastructure or not supposed to be. Um, and they haven't been addressed in years. Our roadways in, in many of the poorest communities are poorly lit or not lit at all. Um, and in some instances, the crosswalks um, in our streets have little to no striping, much of it worn down by years of neglect and, um, and inattention to the decay. So if the conditions are not fit for walking, uh, let alone maybe even a robot delivery, how then could they be ready for self-driving cars? We don't have all the details yet, but the approach being taken now uh, with a bipartisan infrastructure bill and the separate legislation that many Democrats want to pass. Do any of these things, will any of these things, do you think address these, these key issues or are they still not looking in the right direction? Well, I think that um, when we look at the background of transportation in this country, we have, um, we've failed um, for decades when we understand some of the inequities that we've baked into our transportation system, where many communities haven't seen true mobility, um, the government has had a hand in creating those inequities. We build affordable and subsidized housing in places with their, where there are few to no transportation options, uh, little or no access to childcare or, or jobs or healthcare or healthy food options um, where people are living in food deserts and even healthcare deserts. The federal government has created that ecosystem. And so now the federal government has to have a hand in uncoupling these, um, 
these vestiges of inequities in order to not just improve the lives for low income families, but really to pull the entire country into the future. Well, you know, Salika, to jump in here, I, you know, um, we resonate, uh, or I resonate with you uh, on this uh, because this is this is this is a surprising, maybe surprising, maybe that surprising is not the right word. This is a situation we find ourselves in. You know, a lot of people are talking about the infrastructure business, about improving the interstates and so on and getting them and redoing them and da 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 and whatever and somehow they've forgotten about where a lot of people live and 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 in 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 the 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 local uh, uh transportation um, uh, infrastructure that exists uh, starting with sidewalks as you point out but really going to uh, local mobility and and, and they've forgotten and and then and then you get to to the the the, the mobility of we call mobility marginalized communities, you know where if you, I mean, a lot of communities are built. You got to have who knows how many cars, you know, uh, to be able to to live there. And if you don't have a car and for whatever reason, uh, biggest one might be you can't afford it. Um, man, you are. <laughs> The, the opportunities, if mobility is, is the way that you improve one's life, which is the real only reason to have mobility is to improve. Otherwise, you stay where you are. You know, you, you know the fundamentals of, of, of mobility is to improve uh, personal um, uh, utility. Otherwise, you stay where you are. And so you go someplace because, hey, if you go there, you're going to be a happier camper, fundamentally. But of course, that's a happier camper, given whatever it takes you to get there. You have to sure. subtract what it takes because transport. I mean, yes, we all love to joyride or something or get direct benefits. But, you know, forget those guys. Ninety eight percent of the time, you know, you bear a burden to get to someplace. So someplace has to benefit you and be such a benefit such that it's worth the expenditure, not just in money, time, but the, the safety, all, all the all the things, and so you find that that of course the wonderful thing that Henry Ford and the others have created for us is with the car it gave enormous opportunities, and then the economy reacted to it and created all these things to improve quality our our lives. And made it really cheap in the sense, maybe we, you know, maybe we threw a bunch of stuff out the back and so on, made it easier and then really pay for it. But, you know, made it really cheap so that we could all, you know, be really happy campers. I, if, I you just don't, have to, if you don't have a car, you're in trouble in many places. You know, if you don't have right. a car. Yeah. So go ahead. Jump in with me. No, here. I, 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 you know, I mean. I agree wholeheartedly. When when we when we started with the car, if you if you look at Ford, so the idea was not that the car would be a gimmick, no, is that the car would be a problem solver, right? That, um, as I as I say all the time, transportation is mobility, and mobility is freedom. And so the car gave people options of where to go. Um, it it sort of fueled this innovation in the country and lifted people up. From, from poverty into middle class and beyond. But what we see is, you know, the, the, the general inequities that we have in almost every facet of our lives has permeated the transportation ecosystem in America. Low income communities are most likely to be located near highways um, and other transportation facilities like bus depots that lead to, to negative health effects um, which result from vehicle emissions, um, despite the fact that the people in those communities are least likely to have a personal vehicle. Um, the environmental impacts from the highways are crushing these communities when it comes to health issues, from heart attacks to asthma, to cancer, to strokes, reduced lung function, and on and on and on. And, and when we look even at, if we remove ourselves from low income city communities to low income rural communities, um, they are in 
just as bad a state in some instances, even worse, because it's not as if they're trying to figure out those last miles to get to public transportation in their communities, there may not be any public transportation at all. The, the reason that this is something that we all should be concentrated on is we're gonna subsidize people's lives if we don't assist people, if we don't create a better ecosystem, if we don't remove the inequities that we have created, we are all responsible for helping them to eat and have healthcare and, and forget a job because they won't be able to get to one. We also, as, from a business standpoint, you know, as I said, I'm bullish on autonomous vehicles, not just because it's gonna make lives better, but frankly, from an innovation and an industry standpoint, we stand as a country to have a boom from all that we can create and the, and the financial benefits to these companies. But when we look at where we should be first, those who have the least mobility will benefit the best. Here, uh, yeah, I mean, that is, that is those <laughs> that have the least will benefit the most. I, I mean, I want to repeat it because it is absolutely fundamental. And I, I'll even go farther than, than you on this. Look, if we look at public transportation, I mean, take Manhattan out of, out of the picture, okay? Uh, New York, you know, the subway runs 24-7, okay? All right. You know, there you can get mobility, but you still have to you you have to decide when you want to go when 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 the subway does come. Okay, if you're in if 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 you're at Princeton Community Village where we located our low income housing or whatever, so that we could have somewhat of a mixed community here in Princeton, where in the heck did we locate? Princeton Community Village out on cheap land. Why is it cheap land? Because, you know, it's nowhere. And guess what? You end up living out there. Guess what? You better have a car. Otherwise, you can't get a, a, a quart of milk. And my goodness, we, we failed to create, you know, affordable living. We create, oh, yes, great for us. We did a great job. We created affordable, uh, affordable housing. Right, where no one else wanted to live. Otherwise, the damn price of it would have been who knows what. You know, we all know. And and this is like whatever. And so, I guess what fuels me fundamentally with this technology, it is it has the opportunity to level the mobility playing field. It ha it won't be quite as good. It doesn't beat it. Hey, somebody might suggest that it would beat what we all, what most many of us, I'll say even most of us, because it is greater than 50% of the households in the U.S. Most of us have is this really good mobility of the car. Man, we we get out, hop out of our kitchen. We even put the, the, the garages right next to the kitchen so it's so easy to take the stuff in and out. I mean, Henry, thank you for what you did for us, okay? Gave us all this if you happen to have it for you and having one car per household in a rural family is not providing mobility for that household because unless it's a single person household, if there are more people in that household, what about the other three or four or two or whatever? They have to be chauffeured. Okay. They have to be taken around. Otherwise they don't have the mobility of the person that has access to it. Right. Okay, so, so we have don't a talk to me about up, that, huh? You know, we have a boots up mentality in, in the United States. If somebody is, um, is in middle or upper class, they say, well, we've made it. We, we had a chance to do it. Why can't they do it themselves? Failing to understand the kinds of things that you just mentioned, where we, when we want to aid people, we stick them on land or property that is, that is not the best, right? That is not in the middle of That's all we can afford we, to do. I mean, right. we have our excuses. Right. We get that. We understand that. But it's a, but that's the bottom line. But then how do they get from A to B? And how do they pull themselves up from they the They take bootstrap? a bus. Yeah, do you but know how bus? bad bus transportation is compared? Right. I, I love New how Jersey transit. How do you, how do you I, get to the bus? In dense places. Uh, you know, I lived in New Jersey 
for 20 something years. I was born and raised in Long Island. Where's that bus taking you? The bus is probably not even taking you from your house to the local mall so you can get a $15 hour job, which can't even feed your family. We are not thinking about this in the right manner. Absolutely. We've arrived and we want no one else to either arrive with us or we're gonna complain about the cost of, of improving infrastructure. And I wanna say to people, if you get in your car and you drive on the highway to go to your job, to you, you're on a, a roadway in your community to go to the grocery store, everybody paid for that. So if everybody could pay for the roadway for you to be in, in your community, then we have an obligation to pay for the roadways, the sidewalks, the infrastructure in everybody's community. It is not a, I make more money so my roads should be better. It is part of the American fabric to create the opportunity for you to be able to be anything and reach any height. But we've created barriers, both physical and mental, and we need to remove them if we all wanna be on this ride to prosperity. Uh, absolutely agree. I mean, I, I love the way you say it. I mean, it, it is fundamental. And, and to me, what, what I love about this technology and the technology is, is really, uh, you know, it, 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 it's drive, it has to be, I claim it has to be driverless. It has to be a computer doing it rather than people doing it because if people have to operate it, have to be the chauffeur, then they deserve to have a living wage, even if they even deserve to be multi-gillionaires or whatever, why not? They deserve to be paid for that, okay? Unfortunately, that costs. Whereas if I have a computer doing it, this thing, this wonderful thing has had Moore's Law associated with it, you know, and I'm going to I'm going to leverage Moore's Law as much as I can to be to be able to have that sucker do it for me. And so I don't mind making that thing. I don't need at times don't even mind saying, hey, Alexa, do this. Although, I mean, I think it's just a terrible way for us to evolve in terms of, <laughs> you know, ordering things around. But maybe, you know, I can I don't I don't feel too bad about ordering a computer around to shine my shoes. OK, or take me someplace or whatever. And well, this the model is of someone driving you doesn't work today. Look Forward. at those who use access mobility um, in, the, in the disabled community or those who are able differently. When you have to schedule your ride two, three, four weeks in advance and then hope that someone, hope the vehicle shows up because there are a limited number of people to drive those vehicles. The driver shortage is impacting the movement of freight across America. We don't have the bodies to take us everywhere we wanna go. We don't have the bodies to move the goods in the manner that we want them moved. So this goes beyond a nice to have. If we don't get on board, we will find our country grinding to a halt, much like we did during coronavirus, the, the height of the pandemic, because there were less people to move our goods, and then therefore the goods didn't get moved at all. Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, what, what, what Henry and the others created was, was they got us to do the work for ourselves to be able to make it happen. So all of us that happen to have the resources being up here and here and all the various other resources that you needed and they have all the other stuff around it, we could then do it ourselves. I mean, Home Depot has had a wonderful run during the, during the pandemic. Why? Because a lot of people, hey, had nothing better to do. So they did it themselves at home. They, were, they got to Home Depot. I mean, but, you know, however, some people, for whatever reasons, haven't, don't have that. And what making it available to them in the same way that we make it available to ourselves is what I consider to be to be absolutely uh, uh, 
life-changing here. And it's not having, oh, there's bus service every so often that goes between these various points. And of course it doesn't run this, this, and this, but it runs this, this, and this. And as I like to say, you have to have a PhD in schedule reading to be able to figure out when the heck it comes. But you know, that, that's sort of a cheap shot. Sorry for the cheap shot. But you know, fundamentally, that mobility, that opportunity to go improve one's quality of life is just so restricted that, of course, those that happen to not have anything better except for maybe their two legs, okay, you know, really don't get an opportunity to, to enrich their lives, improve, get a better job. Have, I mean, mobility is everything. And what drives me nuts is some people talking about this technology and say, oh, this is going to increase congestion. Because, wait a minute, yo, first of all, I didn't talk about necessarily more vehicle miles traveled. I talked about more people miles traveled. And people miles traveled, not just in certain to better places. And therefore, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean congestion. Excuse me, because, you know, if you really want to talk about congestion, da, 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 I, come on. And anyway, so one and two, even if it does, you mean only the three of us here have the opportunity to have that congestion for ourselves and all you other folks, please, you know, stay home. OK, now, come on. I mean, where's this stuff coming from? How can people sit there and say this stuff? See, Alan, you see the, again, the, my background, it is not that, that I am even suggesting that the autonomous vehicle remove everybody from their original destination to their final destination. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is in the community that has a sidewalk that looks like this, that community is very likely to have a high amount of crime. It's probably not safe for you to walk to the bus stop. If you had an autonomous vehicle to take you to the local public transportation, they are meeting that space. You physically may not be safe to, to be mobile in. We have to look at how the community really is. And, and what happens is the planners who all live in the suburbs come in, they have these great ideas for how they think people are gonna move, right? Just, just get another car, or we'll add bus, um, we'll add bus stops, or we'll increase the route. But I still need to get from my house to the route. If the autonomous vehicle can meet sort of that last mile, then I'm ensuring greater mobility because now I've been able to keep people safe to move to and from their homes. Right now, across America, in lots of cities people feel as if they're hostages in their houses due to the level of crime, which still impacts mobility. Everything that we do has a mobility component to it. So let's, let's, let's see if we can talk about that, okay? Um, which, because, because I'd, I'd like to talk, how, how do I frame it? To, Is that the way people really live? Okay. I'd like I'd like to suggest that maybe it's not. At least I hope that it's not. Okay. And and my I have found myself uh, only a very few times in communities that could have been suggested that was unsafe, standing out like a sore thumb. Okay. I was never threatened. I was embraced. I was welcomed. I've never been mugged. Okay. So my own personal experience, which is exceedingly limited, I mean, you know, handful, unfortunately, I'd like to say, has been nothing but marvelous. People live in these communities. People live, they don't just stay in their houses. I don't believe. Maybe they do. Maybe I need to be educated. 
I think that if you if you embrace that sense of community in the neighborhood and you provide and I like to say mobility opportunities not to escape the neighborhood but to enrich the neighborhood as a place from which you can launch yourself to go get better things and come back to it that that's the focus that I'd like to see in fact the infrastructure bill to deal directly to deal directly with what is it about mobility that can go into a community and enhance its and enhance it however the people want to see it enhanced not the way i see it sitting here in princeton on cleveland lane i mean you know i mean i'm 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 not the guy to do it I, I, well, I'd love to be the guy to do it. I just, I just don't have the experience. It's not, it's not my resume. Okay, but to go and community, neighborhood by neighborhood, and say, hey, here we have this gizmo here. We have this guy. Okay, it's you know, it 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 can move you. Okay, if you want to be moved, not to where I think you should go to where you might like to go. And the, and the, and the conversation st should start there. We, we have such an, the great thing about this mobility opportunity is that we're at the very beginning of it. <laughs> you know, we, we did a few tests, we wrote a little few lines of code, we got a LIDAR, GIDAR, BIDAR, ZIDAR, who knows what are, you know, we can do a couple little things, okay? We're at the very beginning and we can shape this in many different ways at this point at essentially zero incremental cost. Okay. And we, but I don't think we know what to do. And if we're testing in Chandler and if we're testing in downtown um, uh, um, San Francisco and if we're testing in Mountain View, Great for the Chandler's Mount Views and 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 San Francisco's of this world. But guess what? San Francisco has a pretty darn good transit system. That's why you don't want to test in Manhattan. Already has one. Chandler, nobody lives there unless they own who know gazillion cars. Seventy percent of the of the of the households have have two or more cars. You think you're going to beat somebody driving their Tesla, Mercedes, Chevy, Yugo, whatever they have? No, you're not going to beat them, at least not now. Waymo doesn't have a chance. It's good for testing. You can, hey, show I didn't, I didn't crash, check off the boxes. But I mean, you know, Joyride, look at the customer interactions. Okay, it's not about, hey, this improved my life because it got me someplace when I wanted to go. At least I haven't heard it. Maybe I'm not listening. Maybe I'm not paying attention. Well, but so we, you we know, need to listen. Anyway, we need to listen. At this we point, need we, we need to listen. And we need to listen to the right people. Right. The people who can be helped the most. The people whose who's, who's current level with this increment can be improved the most. Somebody that's up here and it's it's not actually gonna improve from I mean, when you get right down to it. In fact, I prefer taking my car in the hell with this thing. And what is it? What do do? Do, 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 do. The hell are we doing it for them? You're not so gonna then, really so then improve who's going in? Who's going into the communities? Who's having a conversation with the communities? I'm gonna Nobody tell you, is I, that I, I know I of. Who is? You tell me. Right. I don't think right. anybody is. Well, okay? somebody might be, but they're not necessarily speaking to the right person. I'm going to also say that we can't discount. Um, this is not about not feeling you not feeling safe in a community. We're talking about mothers across America in in high crime neighborhoods who feel unsafe or or can't get their children to a point where they're moving towards a better life because all there is, is this spot in sort of this godforsaken 
community. It doesn't mean that people on the block don't love each other. It doesn't mean that they're not trying to do their best for each other. But there is, there is a element in the community, small or medium sized, that that coupled with the inability to access mobility means that these people aren't going anywhere in their lives. The mobility is what I am saying has an opportunity to lift out of those circumstances. But if we won't even repair people's sidewalks, if we won't even put striping in crosswalks, if you talk to people in the community, you know, black and brown people are getting killed at higher rates as pedestrians. They're getting killed at higher rates in, in, in communities that the basic infrastructure has not been met. We wanna to get to autonomous vehicles, but put a light overhead so that I can see as I'm walking down the street. Make my pavement, my pavement even, stripe the crosswalks. And let's talk about how we get people from a space where you can't access basic things where they can begin to access a better life. I think the example that I talked about last week with you, Alan, was the one that really struck me um, that 60 Minutes did a piece on in rural communities because I, I never wanna leave a rural community out of the discussion. I think they have similar um, challenges when it comes to autonomous vehicles. And as I said, no public transportation infrastructure. So 60 Minutes does this piece a few weeks ago on accessing the COVID-19 vaccine in Florida. And they look at this community in the Everglades in the Palm Beach County area. And it, this, this, this example drives home the point that your life is literally in jeopardy without good transportation. And, and so I've said, when I hear people say, ever since I've heard this, this art, this uh, piece, when people say that low income people and marginalized communities don't wanna get the COVID-19 vaccine, I have said, um, if, I'm, if I'm trying this case, I'm gonna submit to you that there's a greater correlation between the ability to quickly access the location of the vaccine and those who are vaccinated. Um, in the piece, this Florida community is about 30 miles from the nearest grocery store, which was offering the, the public um, vaccines, no, no cost to the community. The only way that these residents in this area near Lake Okeechobee could access the vaccine was to take multiple modes of transportation. It took them two and a half hours each way in order to be vaccinated. Five hour round trip. It's just not an option, especially for a lot of the elderly, a lot of the disabled. Huge population there is over 65. The circumstances reinforced inequities by increasing access for middle income and affluent people, but continue to make it harder for low income residents who are living in these pharmacy and food deserts. The people who are responsible for transportation planning or building our infrastructure aren't thinking about instances like this. We said, at least the community there said in Florida, we're gonna offer it at this public grocery store and everybody can access it. Now it's, it's shown this bright light on food deserts. Transportation is blocking people away from basic necessities. A absolutely. I mean, you know, if 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 you if you have been have the wherewithal to have your own car and be able to do it for yourself, hey, it's trivial. Okay. If you don't. You are in a completely, you know, different. You, you've you've gone across the twilight zone. You know, you're you're somewhere else, and and everything that we try to do, we to me, we have the opportunity with this mobility to bring those things together. I mean, if I'm telling a computer to go pick you up and so on, go go pick you up, okay. And in some sense, I don't need gazillion of these things i just probably need a handful in, in a rural community just to bounce around take people around 
Now, if I had some retiree who had nothing to do, who wanted to do it and could, you know, get get gas money to do it, they might be there. And and you know, and 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 Catherine Freund, you know, with ITN America, you know, that's one of the things she tries to do, you know, try to get, you know, harness those. But those are in the small, those are infinitesimal, you know, whatever. We have the opportunity to take this technology and just do it. Make it happen. No problem. Why aren't we doing it? Go ahead, Fred. Well, yeah, we're going to come back and continue that discussion. But first, uh, this is a good time to remind you about our sponsor, the Smart ETF, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. To get more info, head to MOTOETF.com. On the website, look for a white paper called the Smart Transportation Revolution. It's under the Insights and News tab. Some good information there to help you make informed decisions about investing. ETFs you may know can be a smart way to spread risk with investments and focus on a particular category of stocks. The website again is MOTOETF.com. We're back with more of the Smart Driving Cars podcast and our guest, Salika Josiah Talbot. In high crime areas, Salika, that you were talking about, how do you convince AV companies that are out there testing, as Alan mentioned, in, in San Francisco and, and in Chandler. How do you convince them come in here? Why do they need convincing? <laughs> Good <laughs> uh, answer. If you're, <laughs> if you're an autonomous vehicle company, um, what you want to do is sell your goods. You want more people using it the government really isn't going to subsidize it to go into a Chandler, right? As, as Alan said, 70% I, hope, I would of hope not. In, I would hope in, not. Right. 70% of the people in Chandler have, have two vehicles in their household. The a, a, a AV company is in the business of making money. This isn't a gimmick for yeah, you know, absolutely. 12 rich people. They want to procure government services, just like companies couldn't wait to get the postal contract and get 750,000 US vehicles that they're, that they're manufacturing. If you want to, to have your business in widespread use, low-income communities where mobility, as I said, is the least, and you can improve it the most, that's where you wanna be. If I'm an AV company, I am absolutely going into a low-income community or one that's, that's sort of on the cusp who has the um, a, a mixed use community. You can find a place like Washington DC in Northwest here, you have beautiful big Victorian homes. Um, and then you have places across the river in, in, in Anacostia where people are living at the very base of poverty. You could use a, a community like Washington DC and, and provide services across the board and show people how you can improve life. And then the gimmick car can go to, you know, the musk of the world while you are making the business case for procuring to government services here in Washington DC or cities across the country. That's what they did when they, when they started with Uber. Uber didn't start in the suburbs. They went to big cities and they, and they you know, did their song and dance across big cities saying we can improve mobility for people. We know that it doesn't quite work and we've seen with the pandemic, these are essential needs for a community and you won't always have a body to fill that essential need. The artificial intelligence can do that. It can still service us no matter what the outside circumstances are. Well, I, I of course agree with you here. This is this is all about if if I have a product, I'm going and I think uh, I'm going to look at where that product is actually going to be the best compete for a a customer to buy it, and it's going to look at what the competition is for that particular product, and it's going to look at what can really benefit the, the consumer to that, unless I'm, you know, selling snake oil, which maybe some people argue that I didn't do that enough selling of, but I'm going to look at where I can deliver the, 
the greatest incremental value to the individual. And I'm going to go after that like you can't believe. Okay. And if I look at this from a fundamental consumption point of view, and I look at what people have access to in mobility, and if I let's take the Chandlers of this world, and I look at Chandler, I say, my goodness, for me to be, to be appreciated in this community, I am going to have to be really good. I mean, I mean, really good. I mean, why? Because the people here, whew, man, do they have a good from a mobility standpoint. And if I look at some other communities and I look at what they have available to them and I look at, oh my goodness, and oh my goodness, and the only reason there's any service here is because they've thrown me a bone or whatever and so on and so forth. And I say, whoa, I'm the opportunity to come here and be appreciated. If I do it right, if I then go and talk to those people and ask them, what is it that you really want of this product? Okay, not what I think you want. What do you want in this product? So in, in, the, in, this, in the AV symposium, it shocked me. The number of speakers, very, you know, they have better resumes than I have, right? Talking about they want to educate the public. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Wait, wait. Time out. Whoa, time out. I know best for them. Are you joking? Wait a minute. Why don't, because what do I, I for, as I said, I come from the wrong place. I have more mobility that I can, than, I, than Carter has little liver pills. You know, I'm well, the this, wrong this is person something that Salika has. This is something it's, Salika has spoken about, the need absolutely. for diversity, gender, racial, you, you name I, I, it. Absolutely. That, that we're, we need to engage people. We need to we need to all be at the table. This is not um, I'm handing down some decree, and <laughs> and we shouldn't wait until we're at the spot where we've perfected the technology, which I hear all the time, and then we're gonna show you what we got. I, I, maybe I don't want it at that point. Maybe you've got something. <laughs> yeah, we're at the beginning. We can shape it still. We can still right. do something about it, as opposed to you know, it's, it's not for me. Let, let, let's put in elevators because now we have to, oh, there's somebody that has to have wheelchair accessibility. Oh, well, we built this in 1900 before anybody even thought it. I mean, oh, we're at the beginning. I mean, we, we, we are, we always get it backwards. We, we, even when we heard at the symposium, someone said, well, we don't want to test on these people first. And I, I how magnanimous of you that, <laughs> that, that you're not, I'm not going to give you this great technology, this great mobility. We're going we're gonna to try it on these other people. And then if it's okay, we'll bring it here. Well, these communities don't believe that nonsense. It, it, that's not how it works. But what we have, Alan, I have to say this, yeah, and, and kudos to the brilliance. Kudos to the brilliance of you and all the engineers and technologists and computer scientists that are working on this. But, but guys, if you women and men come up with this really wonderful technology that's gonna improve people's hearts, the surgeon doesn't turn it over to you and say, please operate. You give it to the surgeon and the surgeon says, well, it may work, it may not work. We need to fine tune this, we need to improve this. We have boardrooms and a C-suite and you look around the room and everybody looks just like one segment of society. We have the people who are planning <laughs> and you look around the room and everybody looks like just one segment of society. Who are you building this for? Why is it so difficult to create a diverse boardroom or diverse C-suite C -suite or diverse community of planners. We need the social scientists 
scientists in the room as well. The, the computer scientist guy is not going to get it all. The engineering woman is not going to get it all. We need everybody to be in that space as we build towards new mobility. We have to do better than we're doing today. Oh, well, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely, absolutely. I think I said it before. I'm not the right person. I can't, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad to go tag along and learn. But I'm not, I'm not you know, because, because my resume is not right. I'm not the right resume for this thing. Well, and, looking and, and looking we, at the nitty gritty with what you're saying, Alan and, and Salika, is there a role for government then in, I don't know, forcing the hand here? To, absolutely. To, to, to making I'll this jump in. I'm happen. not going to wait for Salika. I'm <laughs> going to take that question. I'm going to take it. This is infrastructure. I claim this is infrastructure. Why? What is infrastructure? It's something that you create in advance that then has longevity over the long run to deliver value on the long run. That's what the definition of inf infrastructure is. Something they build, put together, that then once it's created can deliver value over time. What we need to do here is do the front end of this thing. We have to do the sociology piece. We have to do that piece in the neighborhoods to understand how in the heck we should shape this thing at this particular point in time so that when we create it, it then adds the value over time. So it should be embedded in this infrastructure bill and stuff. Why do I put it in there? Is because, boy, this is inexpensive infrastructure. Okay, because we don't have to go put concrete or whatever, anything. We don't have to dig up the earth. We don't have to go whatever and, and, and shape steel and stuff. We just have to use our brains and our heads with the right people to go in there. And guess what? This creates jobs too. Holy mackerel, every union should be for this. I mean, if you look at a piece of infra, unions are for building highways. Why? I don't know what percentage, percentage of the money they get, but it's probably less than 50%. 50% has to be you know, for the concrete and steel and paint and all the other junk. Here, this is just doing knowledge that is going to now create this thing that we're shaping now. This is not testing, this is shaping. This is different than testing. This is shaping it so that in fact, it creates value for that background that, that Salika has there. That's why it's important. I don't know, that's what I think. Well, I think- You can I jump in we, here, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, pick me. Um, I've, I've been in state government in, in a high position. I've, I've been, um, a senior advisor in the Department of Transportation. I wouldn't bet my money on, on government to get it right. We haven't gotten it right for the last 50 years in America. The, the push has to come, and I use that phrase, the political economy of autonomous vehicles, but the push has to come almost externally to the government because what the government right now, what the, the issues we have are legislators, where people from both sides are seeing things so incredibly different, right? The rural communities say, we're not spending money to improve urban centers. We have issues right here. And people in the urban centers say, oh, people in the rural communities have it just fine. There, that, that stalemate I talked about last week is, exists across government where people want it in government just the way it is. Or people in government don't believe that autonomous vehicles can be a thing. Or when we're looking at addressing infrastructure for the future by addressing the problems of today, we've said it's only going to live in the Department of Transportation. And I will tell you that fundamentally, if we don't as a country understand that the improvements that we need to make for transportation equity require not a one department view, but a view from the White House addressing healthcare and environment and energy and commerce and yes, transportation, that's the way to address infrastructure and make the improvements that we wanna meet. But right now we have a stalemate. We can't get basic regs off the ground. We are doing this 
I know it could probably get you some good, healthy food. And I know it could probably get you jobs. And I know it could probably improve your housing condition. But I'm not willing to help that side of America. And I'm not willing to improve conditions for those who need to see doctors on a regular basis or who are in food and pharmacy deserts. I, I know that that can happen, but I don't want to help that side of America. We have a stalemate and that stalemate means that places other countries are moving forward with new mobility. They see it as an opportunity to create equity, to improve mobility, to provide jobs and food and all these other things. And the United States is sitting in quagmire, stuck in this old, archaic and unproductive dialogue where they're pitting rural against the city and we're not moving anywhere. Is that the argument that could work? The threat from China or, or elsewhere here that we're going to fall so far behind? Is that what's going to get these different parties, this, this div political divide to close ranks maybe to some, ex to some extent? Wouldn't you hate that that would be the case. And, yeah. and certainly from an automotive industry, we, you know, US vehicles are made in, in China and, and Chinese vehicles are made in the United States. We're incestuous in the automotive industry. I don't, I don't know that we need to say, you know, we're scared that, that foreign um, entities are gonna get better technology as much as we should be scared that we are not keeping up <laughs> for the benefit of our nation. We need to keep up and, and as Americans generally do, surpass for the benefit of our people, not because we don't like someone else or we, or we need to be better than somebody else. We're doing it because we have fundamental problems in this country today and we need to address them now. So is what you're saying this needs to come as, as part of the, the, the package that's being addressed now? Uh, come from the White House that this has got to be part of it? I think there needs to be, um, and I say this every chance I get, a autonomous vehicle, electric vehicle, new mobility czar sitting in the White House. I could, you know, Alan ha hasn't talked to me about electric vehicles, but, you know, I can buy, if I can afford to buy a $100,000 electric vehicle, do I really need a $12,000 government credit on my taxes? I mean, what are we doing as a nation when roadways look like they do behind me? But, but we need to incentivize the person who can buy a six-digit vehicle. Something's wrong. Something uh, is yeah, very well, wrong. Well, uh, yeah, this is a leak and we can't so Yeah, we don't want to go there because I agree with you. I mean, my goodness, there, there, there are so many advantages. And then uh, what, no, no, the, we, we can, the, we'll be okay, here we all day. We we'll we'll be that. here all day. What I would what what I what I would like like to say is that I think that I don't think the industry has thought enough about what we were been talking about here today, and hopefully through our discussion here today, it, maybe somebody will listen to it or something like that, and hopefully TRB will distribute your comments that you made uh, that you made during the AV community and distribute it beyond those that. That, that paid registration because it, it, it has not, I don't believe it has been part of the conversation. I think to, you know, to, to their credit, they're, were they testing? They've got to test, you know, at one point GM came in and said they were going to test in Manhattan. And I think that idea lasted about uh, about 12 seconds and they realized oh, you got to be joking. Okay. And they backed off uh, to their credit. Though, okay. And so, you know, if you look at, at, at Google Waymo, where did they test first in Nevada where there was nobody and then they played around in, 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 in nice, um, you know, mountain view. View, which is nice, well behaved, and then they went to a really well behaved place, which which was Arizona. F great. This is this is very difficult. You know, it, I've I've argued I don't know how many times on these things. You do, you don't want to be Frank Sinatra in this one. You don't want to make you know make it in the big so that you can make it everywhere. And and this whole concept about everywhere business with level fives and so on that the SAE has 
promulgated on us is just uh, so bad, so bad, so bad for all the reasons. My goodness, this is tough. Uh, we only have a chance to do it in the easy places first. And of course, one looked at the first easy place and saw, oh my goodness, uh, we're not good enough for these people, really. They're not going to buy this. This is not here. So let's look at, not that, that, not that, that, that uh, low-income neighborhoods are, are the easy places, but at least there you have a chance of being really delivering value. You have a chance to return something. You have a chance to be appreciated you have, if you do it right. But the problem is, is that we haven't, and I'll throw myself, I have not spent enough time in these communities to understand what it is that would, would really improve their quality of life, that they would cherish and protect, that they would use to, to lift themselves uh, 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 to a better level from their point of view, not my point of view, their point of view. The beauty is, is that everybody has his, his and her own point of view, and we want to do it from their point of view. It's not, I'll, I'll take care of myself, thank you, or whatever, or try to anyway, but I can't, you know, put my brain in, in, into somebody else's brain and say that. So to me, that's what's really important here. And if we could get these companies, the Waymo's, the Ford's, the GM's, the Amazon Zooks's, of this world, and maybe if Chris Urmson, now that he's going public for 13 big ones or whatever he's doing, whatever, you know, those folks, and look at the places where they could really make a difference. And maybe we need Melinda Scott in here to throw some money into this thing and say, hey, this really improves people's lives because nobody's really looking at this. Yeah, we did a little bit in Columbus. Okay, that was a very good choice by by the government to to put the smart cities or whatever that was in Columbus for very good reasons. It was beautiful. Okay, all right, but you know there we we haven't done at least or maybe I just haven't been paying attention. And sorry for everyone if I haven't been paying attention and I haven't seen it. Well, on on that note, Alan, we want to. Thanks, Salika, and we're going to continue this discussion, I hope, in the not-too-distant future. Salika, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Is there a place where, where people can go to, to follow some of the work that you're doing or just keep an eye on the Forbes, et cetera? Forbes, LinkedIn, and um, Salika at avevcar.com, S-E-L-I-K-A, avevcar.com. Terrific. We also want to thank our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF. The ticker symbol for the ETF is MOTO, and you can get more information at MOTOETF.com. You can find us, once again, at SmartDrivingCar.com, on Anchor FM, Spotify, TuneIn, Apple, Google, Spreaker, SoundCloud, wherever you turn to for podcasts, your smart speaker can play us too. You can find my tech reports at Textination.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Alan Kornhauser. Thank you for listening or watching. Please continue to stay safe. And thank you, everybody, and have a great week.